Welcome everyone, bienvenidos to today's core training on refining program outcomes and evaluation tools with an equity lens. I'm Nicole Lezen, one of the local consultants who facilitates a countywide initiative called Collective of Results and Evidence-Based or Core Investments, along with Nicole Young, and we are your hosts and trainers today. And as you can hear, our Core Institute events are held bilingually in English with Spanish interpretation, thanks to our team members, Stella Larman, who provides simultaneous interpretation and translates all of our core materials, and Gisela Carrasco, who's providing consecutive interpretation right now, and will also translate your comments and questions in the chat. So I'll turn it over to Nicole Young, who's gonna start us off with a poll. Great, thanks, Nicole. So we wanted to start off just getting a sense of what comes to mind or what feeling comes up for you when you hear the word evaluation. We know that uh, there can be a range of thoughts and feelings and reactions that come up. So when you hear the word evaluation, does that make you feel happy and excited? Meaning that you're super excited to be here today. Uh, does it make you intrigued and curious? Very sleepy, a little nervous? apprehensive, or some other uh, emotion or feeling that we haven't listed here. So we'll give you just a couple of moments to think about that and pick the answer that feels most like you when you hear the word evaluation. I'll give it just another couple seconds. Feel happy and excited, intrigued and curious, very sleepy a little nervous, apprehensive, or something else. Okay, I think we have all our answers. So I'm gonna end the poll and let's take a look at this. So we have a pretty even split here between intrigued and curious and a little nervous. And I'm guessing that if we gave you the option to pick more than one answer, <laughs> we might see even more uh, emotions listed here. So. That's pretty common. I would say we probably all feel the same way too, that um, if, uh, evaluation and learning from evaluation can be really interesting and, and uh, can help feed curiosity. And also it can be a, a little nerve wracking to really think about how do you structure an evaluation and think about outcomes and results. So we hope that you find today's uh, training both interesting and intriguing and, and doesn't add to the nervousness. Okay, next slide. So here's our agenda for this afternoon. We'll do our usual overview of core investments, and then we'll spend the bulk of our time talking about measuring change. And so we wanna take a moment to give you an overview of what's called the equitable evaluation framework. There are some concepts in there that we think will be uh, really useful that we hope you'll find ways to incorporate it or, or uh, see how it's relevant to your core applications. And then we'll talk through some tools and techniques and ways of thinking about how to refine short and intermediate term outcomes with an equity lens. And then we'll finish with some additional equity centered evaluation tips and tools. We will leave time for questions at the end and then we'll talk about uh, next steps and what, uh, what other trainings and technical assistance are available between now and the application deadline. And before we start going into our content, we want to take just a moment to review some of the group agreements that we like to use in these kinds of trainings that will help create a brave and inclusive learning space. So we realize that um, people may be coming with all different levels of knowledge, comfort, interest, and in things like outcomes and equity. So we want this to be a place where everyone can feel like they can ask questions, um, share their perspectives, share their experiences. We'll ask you to share examples of things you're working on or things that you've noticed within your own organizations. So to have this be a really um, you know, valuable, helpful learning space, we'll just ask everyone to share the air. Uh, we do encourage participation both in the chat and out loud. So uh, just ask everyone to be mindful of how much of that airtime uh, that you're taking up and making sure everyone has that chance to have their voice heard again in the chat or out loud. We encourage you to lean into, into discomfort. If, if you're one of the ones that said that evaluation makes you feel a little nervous, then 
I would encourage you to, to just hang in there and um, take in as much as you can. Also take risks in terms of trying things out when we have some practice opportunities, sharing with each other, because again, that, that helps feed the learning. We encourage everyone to speak from their own experience, knowing that everybody's experience uh, is likely to be different and that we will listen fully to each other, be fully present during this training. So that again, we particularly love it so we don't feel like we're just talking to ourselves. <laughs> um, we invite everyone to be curious and call each other into the learning process versus calling each other out or making each other feel like we're wrong or, 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 or dumb for not knowing something. So again, calling each other into that learning process. Um, separating intent versus impact just means that sometimes we might still, even with good intentions, say or do something that comes across the wrong way or rub someone the wrong way. And you, so we just, in order to stay in that learning mindset, want to remember that that may not have been the intent. And we can certainly explain the impact of someone's words or actions on us. We ask everyone to honor confidentiality. Um, just remember this is being recorded. And then we post these videos on the Core Investments YouTube channel. The links to those will be shared on HSD's website. So it's just mostly a, um, a reminder that it's up to you to, to, to decide how much you want to say during these meetings, especially if we're <clears throat> talking about your applications or your outcomes, totally up to you to decide how much you want to share. And also, even though it's being recorded, just that the rest of us will remember if we hear someone else share something, that it's their story, their example to share, and not ours. And lastly, we encourage everyone to practice self-care. So we do have a break built into this two-hour training, but if there are moments where you need to turn your camera off to eat or stand and stretch or take a, a bio break and it's not the scheduled break time yet, please make sure you do that. Okay, how does those sound, everyone? Do those agreements, everyone's willing to follow for the next couple hours? Great, thank you. Okay, so our, our short overview of core investments. Uh, some of you I, I know have heard this multiple times, but we always like to go through it for those who may be less familiar. So core investments is what we call, uh, it stands for the collective of results and evidence-based investments. We think of it as both a funding model and a movement to achieve equitable health and well-being in Santa Cruz County using a results-based collective impact approach that's responsive to community needs. So a lot of key words in there that we wanted to highlight. And at the center of core investments is, is equity in you know, our mission, the vision, the values, which we're not showing in these slides today, but we really try to remind ourselves constantly of um, the importance of equity in order to achieve this vision of health and resilience uh, and a thriving community. Next slide. And so when we say equitable health and well-being, we mean that all people across the lifespan have equitable opportunities to experience these eight interdependent and interconnected core conditions for health and well-being. And so we want to be able to get to a place and see that people's opportunities and their life outcomes aren't predictable for better or for worse by things like race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, immigration status, language, uh, and so on and so on. And so we, again, we put equity at the center of this diagram to illustrate and to remind us that we have to examine and address our individual, our organizational and our systemic beliefs and practices and structures that often are the things that perpetuate the very inequities that we're trying to eliminate. And then when you look at the core request for proposals or RFP, you'll see that there's a whole section in there that, that describes and defines uh, what equity means in the context of this particular funding process. Uh, it's acknowledging that, that equity is central to core investments, um, that it really forces us or requires us to think about particular populations who may face particular obstacles to health and well-being, and then think about solutions that are tied to needs and that address the root causes of inequity, not just the visible symptoms or concerns or problems that we see. Another key concept in terms of equity and core is that we think of it as both a process, the way we do things, and the desired impact. 
uh, and that we focus on anti-racism and racial ex equity explicitly, but not exclusively. So we often use that term intersectionality to acknowledge and really be explicit about the ways that racism intersects with other forms of oppression um, based on gender or ability or, um, or sexual orientation or things like that. And then again, in the RFP, it, again, and I just said this a moment ago about, you know, that we're really wanting to work towards a, a, a community and a place and systems where opportunities, again, aren't limited by different demographics or social identities. And so Nicole and I provide these trainings and technical assistance. Right now, we're really focused on training and TA related to the core requests for proposals. Um, but some of you are familiar with things that we also do, like the core coffee chats and core conversations. So all of that we offer under the umbrella of the Core Institute for Innovation and Impact, which is really like a container that holds an array of learning opportunities, training, TA, um, for all different types of groups. And so again, we'll, we'll talk at the end of the session today about the remaining training and, and TA opportunities uh, before the due dates for the core applications. Uh, and then just as a reminder, Nicole's role and my role is to really help provide the training and tools related to some of those key concepts in the core RFP. So things like outcomes and equity um, and the core results menu. If you have specific questions about the actual application or the RFP or deadlines or why are you asking this and not that and the art, like those kinds of questions should be directed towards the county's email address, the core funding at santacruzcounty.us and Gisela just put that address in the chat. If you have questions about any of the trainings, the TA, some of these concepts, um, feel free to email Nicole and me. Okay, so I'll turn it back over now to Nicole to talk about the equitable evaluation framework. All righty, well, thank you. And um, be before we get into some of the content about the equitable evaluation framework, we thought we would share some evaluation humor. There is such a thing as an evaluation humor genre. And so this has got someone asking, what kind of evaluation did you need? And the answer is, our projects coming to an end, and we were told that we needed an evaluation. What kind is that? Well, I had the misfortune of working on a project exactly like this. I do not recommend it. And so today we hope to give you some insights and tools and tips that'll help you think about evaluation questions and methods and results up front with an equity lens. The good news is that whether you're new to evaluation or have already participated in evaluations, the existing core tools are relevant and we hope they will help you a lot as you think through these things for, for the core RFP and other, other uh, tasks as well. So what is equitable evaluation? It really represents shifts in evaluation practice. So it's not a completely new or different way to approach evaluation. It just um, builds on how we think of evaluation as an opportunity to learn. And that's the spirit behind today's training. It can take a lot of different forms, but the basic idea is for all evaluation is what do we want to know? Why do we want to know that? And how do we learn about what we or the information that we're seeking? How do we learn about what, what works, what doesn't work, how to fine tune things? There's so many approaches to doing that, depending on the scope of what you're trying to evaluate, how complex it is. Um, and in general, evaluations start out by posing questions about a program, a policy, a practice. So for example, does it work the way we intended? What can we learn about how and why it works? Is it reaching the people it's designed to reach? Is it achieving the outcomes that we thought it would? If so, what is driving that success? And if not, what should we be improving? Or maybe we need to change our outcomes instead of what we're doing. Did we achieve something that we didn't anticipate? So that's another uh, way that we can track things through evaluation. To answer those kinds of questions, we need to use different methods and we can observe what's happening in front of us. 
We can conduct interviews with people or conduct surveys of people who are participating in a program. Maybe we deploy those surveys before and after an intervention to see whether anything actually changed or anyone's better off. Maybe we go into a deeper dive and develop some case studies that illustrate what's happening. And of course, um, there are lots of ways to collect data about who's participating, how they participate, what happens as a result of their participation. And sometimes that data is not even a direct um, interview or survey. It's something administrative, like who's eligible or enrolled, what's the uptake for something. And sometimes we do comparisons of a group or a place that's participating in a program compared to a group or a place that isn't participating. So those are, there are lots of different methods that can be matched and mixed together to, um, to answer some of the questions that an evaluation poses. And so lots of evaluations also mix these together. So for example, qualitative data like stories and interviews blended with quantitative counting or numbers. And that's one of the things we'll be talking about in our training next week. And to conduct an evaluation, you also need a team of people. So sometimes it's an outside evaluator, either an individual or a firm, or an internal team, or often a mix of both of those. And someone or several someones has to help pose these questions and refine them design what kinds of data collection tools and strategies you're using or adapting, and then analyze the data to make some sense of it and share the results. And that someone or someones um, has to be invested in what the findings are and how to share them in a way that leads to new learning, new knowledge, and change as appropriate. So those kinds of questions out of an evaluation might be, what would we what does it all mean? What, what needs to change? What could we do differently in the future? What have we learned from all of this? What else does, what other questions are raised? What else do we wanna know? And who else needs to know what alongside us, what we're learning? So an important part of this is when that learning, when and how that learning occurs and not waiting till the end or for some report that very few people read or see. An equitable evaluation is just taking those same pieces and shifting them by asking different questions. So equitable evaluation really just pushes us to think differently and we would argue to ask better questions. Like other applications of an equity lens, these kinds of questions get us closer to an understanding of root causes and the role of systems and structures in uh, cementing certain kinds of inequities in our society. And that gives us more opportunities to actually address them. Another aspect of equitable evaluation is that it really evaluates the evaluators. So that asks for that first piece about what, what kinds of questions are posed by an evaluation. An equity-focused evaluation really asks us to think about who is it that's asking those questions? Who defines success? Who's being evaluated and who isn't? Who's the primary user of these evaluation findings? Who are the actual evaluators and who's considered an expert on the information that you're gathering? What counts as evidence? And what's the role of trust and relationships in all of this? An equitable evaluation approach brings these questions front and center because for, for a long time, they were never asked at all. And so um, it really makes a difference to think about these questions in an evaluation. A lot of what we're sharing with you today is from the Equitable Evaluation Initiative, and you can see the logo for that at the top of this, this slide. The Equitable Evaluation Initiative has posed these three principles and um, just, just all is putting a link in the chat if you wanna do a little bit more uh, digging and read some more details about these. But it's a great starting place if you're curious about some of the information that we're sharing in summary form in today's training. And this initiative has its roots in philanthropic funding and it's also supported by some major national foundations. And the principles that you can see here are that evaluation and evaluative work should be in the service of advancing equity, that that's, that's something to really highlight and not just have off to the side, but really um, front and center in your evaluation. 
and that evaluative work should be designed and implemented to be commensurate with the values that underlie equity work. So for example, the evaluation should be, and its results should be valid for different cultures, not just one. And that makes the findings more useful in more settings. Participants or people with lived experience should have a say in what's being measured and shared. They shouldn't just be the generators of information and data, but actually part of part owners of the data. And sometimes you can hear that, that principle encapsulated by the phrase, nothing about us without us. And then the third principle is about how evaluative work can and should answer critical questions about the historical, structural, systemic drivers of inequity. And um, we've been hearing more and more about this with, with the attention to equity and, and when you start asking more questions about why things are the way they are. When you factor that into an evaluation, you really start to look at your findings differently. So for example, if you were evaluating graduation rates in a school district, if you were looking at differences in graduation rates and did not look at differences in how a school is staffed or how a district is spending per pupil or other structural systemic factors that affect that outcome, then you would not be conducting an equity focused evaluation or advancing equity in your findings. So it's just asking us to step back and look at those factors alongside others as well. So that was a very quick tour of some of the principles of equity focused evaluation. And we've already thrown quite a bit of information at you and we'll continue to do that. But we'll have some opportunities to process all this together and think about how you're thinking and applying these concepts. Do you have questions right now for us though, before we move forward into some other reviews? Not seeing any hands up at the moment. Um, in the the questions that you had along with the uh, equitable um, evaluating the evaluators, what the last question, what's the role of trust and relationships? Um, what did you mean? Well, it sometimes um, the field of evaluation has um, put a premium on being completely objective and outsiders and that that if you're too close to something, then you might be biased and not really understand it. And equity focused evaluation um, questions that and says that somebody who does have, it doesn't mean that that can't yield valid results, but if you do have a relationship with the, um, the organization or the population that's being evaluated, that the trust that that, that engenders can help your evaluation. People might be more willing to participate. They might be um, more willing to go the extra mile to participate in a sense-making meeting that takes time away from an otherwise busy day. And that might provide the invaluable insights that you just couldn't get from a survey or a questionnaire. Um, people might be willing to talk to an evaluator that knows the community and has a, a history of um, sharing findings and honoring the way people see um, an issue in their community that they might not be willing to talk to an outsider. So it's just asking, it's asking some questions about the cost of um, having somebody who is supposedly neutral or external and, and valuing the idea that there are, um, there are benefits to having a lot of trust and, and a strong relationship between an evaluator and what's being evaluated. Thanks. You're welcome. Nicole, anything to add? No, oh, that's great. Okay. Any other questions? All righty. Well, let me turn it back to Nicole. Hi. So, We'll talk about how to refine your short and intermediate term outcomes with an equity lens. So we realize that some of you might have already been working on your core applications and maybe you've gotten as far as drafting your outcomes. If that sounds like you, then treat this as a refresher and a, way, and a chance to 
then look at or think about what you've drafted and see, oh, is there anything that could be refined or tweaked about it so that that equity focus comes through really explicitly. Um, and some of what we'll talk about too, it, it, it may be useful in other areas of your application, other responses, so it doesn't all just have to be packed into the outcome statements. If you haven't yet started drafting your responses and your outcomes, then hopefully you find this helpful in terms of giving you some pointers about where and how to start. So I'm actually gonna start with a, a little overview of some of the things we've covered in previous trainings. Uh, and I know that some of you have attended those, uh, the ones that we did on how to develop a theory of change and a logic model using the core tools. Uh, Giselle is gonna post the link to the YouTube channel where you can find all of those again, uh, because today's just gonna be a really short um, overview of those. And Nicole, do you mind bringing up the slide? I'm sorry, I don't know what happened there. Let me try that again, sorry. Great, thank you. Um, and so you might remember if you were in our earlier trainings that we started with and we recommend going through an exercise of developing a theory of change, even if it's not something that you're required to submit or you know, attach to a grant application, it's just a really helpful thought exercise to go through, especially if you're working with a team of people to develop a program or plan a program or plan your evaluation, um, let alone write a, a grant application together. So the three main components of a theory of change that really explain why you're doing what you're doing is the problem or need statements, the context and the solutions. Uh, and so the problem you know, is, is your opportunity to describe what is the issue or the area of concern um, that you are addressing. The context is speaking about the assumptions about why that problem exists in the first place, what are the root causes, and then your solutions are really at this point in a theory of change, kind of your hypotheses or your best guesses about what would be needed to address the problem. And so at each of these steps, you can think about how to apply an equity lens by using a variety of quantitative data and qualitative data. So the data and stories can help really paint a full picture of that problem or need. That's where um, in the core application, there are actually some specific questions that ask you to describe uh, the need or challenge in a community to describe the inequities that exist. Um, so that's part of describing the problem or need statement. And so data and stories is a great way to then do that with an equity lens. Um, then in terms of the context, uh, you know, if you have described your problem or need with, using data and stories, that actually should raise some questions about, well, why are particular groups of people affected more than others? Or why does that problem exist in the first place? What's at the root of it? Um, and are there some systemic barriers such as like things like eligibility criteria or language access or other policies and norms that are actually creating those inequities? So that is part of uh, what you can think about and try to weave into your context. And again, there are some questions in the core application where you would have the opportunity to, opportunity to describe those root causes, those systemic barriers. And it's helpful to do that so that when you are then describing or hypothesizing about solutions, that you're doing that with that equity lens and thinking about, okay, what are the culturally responsive approaches or strategies to address the community need or those inequities? This is where approaches like targeted universalism might come in handy. We did a core coffee chat uh, a while, a couple months ago now, um, on this concept of targeted universalism, the idea that you can uh, choose and implement strategies that, you know, theoretically would benefit everybody in a community. So hopefully improve health and well-being for, for everyone. And you've chosen uh, specific strategies that uh, you have reason to believe would be particularly effective at closing those gaps or those disparities for particular groups. 
that's that concept of targeted uni universalism. So again, those are some ways to take this tool, a theory of change, which um, isn't always necessarily like equity doesn't necessarily come through explicitly unless you really think about in each step of the way how to how to weave that in. Same thing with the logic model, which again we covered in previous trainings. And on the next slide, you'll see you know the basic building blocks of a logic model, right? That really explains what you're doing um, and breaking it down into uh, basically like a series of if-then statements. If we have these resources, which are often called inputs, to do these activities for these participants, and activities and participants are often called outputs then we can expect, want, and hope to see these short-term, intermediate, and long-term changes. Um, and so that's often what we call the outcomes or the results. And then on the next slide, you'll see that again, th that we can take a logic model and really make sure that the equity lens is explicit. So you could be asking your question, yourself questions like this as you're going through the steps of creating a logic model. You're thinking about inputs to be asking yourself, what resources do you have or do you need in order to increase equity? So if you've already gone through your exercise of creating your theory of change and you've identified you know, the problem or need, the inequities that you're now thinking about, okay, what resources do you have or need in order to close those gaps and increase equity? It might be that you need or have bilingual and bicultural staff that you need or have bilingual evaluation tools, that you're engaging participants as co-designers of your programs and or your evaluation. Um, and so those are good questions both to ask to make sure you're really thinking through like what it takes to implement a program with an equity lens. It also might have some budget implications. So if you don't have some of those things yet, or you need to make sure that you can uh, sustain or maintain some of those inputs, you might need to budget for them and then make sure you're explaining that in a budget narrative or wherever else there might be opportunities in your grant application. When it comes to outputs, you could again apply an equity lens asking yourself, well, who are the participants and are you, um, do you have particular strategies or ways that you might reach and build the relationships with um, people, groups of people who are most impacted by the inequities you've defined, and what activities or strategies are needed to address the problem you've identified and increase equity. And I'll show you in a moment uh, a tool, again, that might help guide that kind of thought process as you're picking or describing your activities and strategies. And then finally, in the outcomes or results area, uh, a question you could be asking yourself is what results will tell you that the activities or strategies that you're implementing are actually increasing equitable health and well-being. Um, so in a theory of change, you've kind of given yourself the freedom to just hypothesize, say, well, I think this would work. I think this is what would be needed. And, and maybe you have some data to back that up. Um, but here in the outcomes, when you're building your logic model, you're really challenging yourself, asking some of those same questions that you know, Nicole had, had described earlier in the equitable evaluation framework, like how do you really know or, or um, how realistic is that, that the strategies really will address those, um, those inequities. Okay, and again, we'll show you another tool that again might help you as you think through how to frame your outcomes. In fact, I think I'll go ahead and share my screen. So everything I'm going to about to say over the next several minutes uh, is actually on the slides that we shared and, and we'll send those out again after the training. But right now I'm going to switch over to website. So some of you again may have been on previous trainings where we've provided an overview and a little uh, tour of different tool core tools, one of them being DataShare Santa Cruz County. DataShare itself is a platform that has all kinds of community level data and demographics. Um, and we wanted to embed or house one of the core tools on, on here that we call the core results menu because we thought we saw the value in 
having the core conditions of health and well-being be tied to impact statements that are tied to actual community data whenever it's available. The core results menu, we won't go into detail today, um, but you'll see on this page that um, there's a couple of links here in, in a few different places to a strategies and program outcomes tool. It's both here and also at the bottom of the results menu. And so this particular tool we created just as a way to think of it like a, an a la carte menu <clears throat> where it has a lot of items in here. It's certainly not the expectation that everybody would like, you know, do everything that's listed here in this menu, but think of it as a menu that you can look through and then pick and choose phrases, uh, activities, examples that feel relevant to you and, and feel like useful language for you. So the way to view this is I just uh, expanded the four kind of broad categories that uh, are ways that we think about how to answer this question. Where are you focusing your efforts and where are you focusing your efforts with a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens? So these four kind of top level er top level categories are people, organizations and systems, places and communities, and then public and political will. So again, depending on if you've, especially if you've done a theory of change and you've thought through, okay, well, what are the effective solutions? What are the necessary solutions? Your solutions might fall into one or more of these categories. If you're not sure, quite sure what to call the thing that you have in mind, again, this is where the, the menu and the sample phrases we've given might, might be helpful. So if you're thinking about focusing your efforts on people, people meaning who is currently experiencing the inequities, who's most affected, um, and then who, and who are those same people that might benefit from the specific programs or policies that you're thinking about. So here you see we've listed some examples. Maybe it's women experiencing homelessness, seniors who are homebound, undocumented immigrants and mixed status families. So you might, uh, particularly when you're, when you're thinking about this through an equity lens, think about how specific you may need to be to really describe who is, who is that group that's most affected by the problems or the inequities. And then these, what we've listed here, what you see kind of in the larger font, outreach, engage, education, engagement, and services, or identify issues and respond early. Those are what we think of as like the strategies, the broad categories of activities. And then we've listed some examples of what might be types of activities that would, that would fall into that strategy. So we've done that also thinking about not only if you're trying to reach people, but maybe there are, um, policies or practices within organizations or systems that are actually the things that are the um, drivers of change or the levers for change that would then impact equitable health and well-being. So some of them might be things that need to be shifted or changed within your own organization. Maybe it's your hiring practices, or maybe it's a broader system like a school district uh, or a multi-agency collaborative system that really needs to take a look at you know, their operational policies and practices, uh, how, how services are coordinated across sectors. If any of you are, are thinking about the targeted impact uh, grant tier, um, there, there may be things in here that, that uh, will feel particularly useful or relevant as you describe, like how it is that, you're, that you propose to create that collective impact that's not just reaching and impacting individual people, but uh, broader segments of the community. Uh, because it's similar line of thinking when you, you know, if you're focusing or en on enhancing the places and communities where people live, work and play, that may mean, you know, defining or describing particularly na particular neighborhoods or geographic regions or aspects of a community infrastructure, like, parks and, and roads and internet and, and things like that. So again, just lots of examples here that we've listed. Or maybe what you're focusing on or what you think needs to be part of the, the solutions or strategies are building the public and political will 
to uh, create and implement policies, practices, and investments that would then enhance quality of life um, and equity, again, for a whole community, not just individuals or, or kind of pockets of the community. And so this could mean trying to uh, reach and engage and, and work with and build power among people that have um, influence or decision-making power. And that can be uh, you know, community and parent leaders, could be elected officials, uh, it could be just the general public that has you know, uh, the ability to vote. We can just wanted to give uh, lots of examples here about how to think about strategies and activities that, that would connect them to the solutions you've identified in your theory of change. And then continuing down here, you, you'll see we've done something similar with program outcomes. So again, thinking about program outcomes as uh, a way to then answer that question, is anybody better off as a result of the programs, projects, activities that you implemented? Uh, and then breaking that down further into thinking about what types of changes are you hoping to accomplish in the short term or the intermediate term. So short term just meaning sometimes it's time, it's, it's related to time, like within a year, within six months. Sometimes it just means what change happens first before you see the ultimate change that you're hoping to, uh, to measure. So again, if you click on those little symbols there, you can expand the menu. And so we've um, given some more examples here about kind of different types of short-term outcomes based on what type of change you are proposing to influence or create through your programs or activities. So is it change in awareness about particular issues, the change in knowledge about particular topics or issues? Is it that you're trying to change people's attitudes or beliefs about either themselves, about the issue that you're working on, uh, about their readiness to do something, their willingness to do something, their confidence level? Those are all examples of attitudes and beliefs. Or are you trying to change their skills, their ability to actually do something? Um, and so we've listed it here, and you'll see in a moment another tool we'll share uh, called the results change results chain, that often that the changes, like in order to change someone's skills or for, for them to build their skills, there's usually some change in awareness that happens first, change in knowledge, <laughs> uh, potentially a change in, in attitudes or beliefs that happens before or in order for someone to be um, ready, willing, able, open to building those skills. Um, and so sometimes uh, these kind of earlier changes might be measured. Other times you might say, no, nope, I'm gonna go straight to measuring this change in skills here. Similar concept applies to intermediate outcomes. So it's the idea is thinking about, okay, if those changes in awareness, knowledge, attitudes and beliefs and skills occur, then what behaviors might change? What might people do differently? They might increase, or improve or decrease a particular behavior. Um, you might actually be interested in measuring that there's a certain amount of change that happens within a certain population or group that you're working with. And then taking a step further, you could ask what changes in status might happen in someone's health status, their education status, their economic status, uh, and so on. If certain behaviors change or if certain conditions or circumstances change. So again, you might think of it in terms of uh, within a particular group of people, the amount of change that you hope to see and whether it's increased or decreased or even just maintaining an ideal or optimal status. Um, and so again, we've just listed a, a few different examples of ways to phrase outcomes um, depending on what it is that you uh, think is achievable and realistic to and meaningful to measure. So that's, we just wanted to, if you haven't participated in one of our earlier trainings on 
core results menu, I wanted to just uh, walk through that again, because in the core um, application, again, you'll be asked to identify as little as one outcome or accomplishment, as many as I think eight outcomes, depending on what tier you're applying for. And Nicole, I, I actually don't have the PowerPoint open. Do you mind bringing up the slides again? While you're doing that, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, so my question is around the, the short-term and the intermediate-term outcomes, because starting to work our way through the core application, and it's asking us to commit to, as you just said, Nicole, those very specific, like for ours, it's five outcomes um, that we hope to see. And I know from reporting on the current core contract that we have, that's an annual report, right? Semi-annual and then annual. You maybe not are not able to answer this question, but what if some of the outcomes we want to see are not the kind of thing that's going to happen within one grant year? Is there a way or can you suggest a way that we might structure our outcome so that what we are achieving, you, I think you understand the question. <laughs> yes, yeah, right, because it can take time, right, right to see the, the outcomes. Right, um, and so this, then if we report and we say, well, we can't, we right. can't report this because we haven't accomplished it yet. Yeah, um, so two things. One is this next concept and exercise we'll go through might actually help with that. Um, and in the application itself, you know, it asks you to describe your outcomes for the first year. And then there is, I think, I believe a separate question that gives you the option to describe if your outcomes will somehow be different in years two and three to describe that. So that would be a good opportunity or place to then say, um, you know, in years two and three, we anticipate being able to measure these outcomes um, after, you know, building the capacity or, or whatever it might be in year one. Does that make sense so far, Kate? Yes, yeah, thank you, that's very helpful. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then this next tool might also be helpful. So, um, you know, either if you're not sure yet what outcome or outcomes you want to include, or you're, you're struggling with a similar thing, like what Kate just described, like, well, it's not going to happen in one year, like, and maybe not even in two years. Um, it could be a, a useful, again, thought exercise or planning exercise to actually build an entire results chain. So if you take a particular, um, you know, program or service or practice that you're implementing to kind of plot out what you think that progression of change will, will be. And I would say at this point, as you know, when it's your in using it as kind of a thought exercise, don't worry about the time. Like, don't worry about, okay, is that year one? Is that year two? Just really kind of think through what, what change and awareness do you think might happen first as a result of your program or service or, or project? What change in knowledge might happen at once that awareness is increased? You know, is there a change in attitudes or beliefs that you think would happen next? What, what are there actual skills? you hope that, that someone would build, um, you know, is what particular behavior change or new or different behavior might happen? And then what status change might that lead to? And it doesn't necessarily mean that then you're gonna propose like all five outcomes or that you have to say, oh, we have to promise that we'll measure and be able to show that that status change happened. This kind of results chain again is really just for a planning exercise because it may help you then identify, okay, it actually is based on what we do and the length of time we're involved with our participants and the way that our evaluation is structured. We might hope that this whole chain of results happens, but what we can realistically measure might be the skills or it might be the change in knowledge. Um, but at least then you've really thought through that whole kind of logic chain. So Nicole and I have a couple examples that we can walk you through just to give you a sense of how this might work. And then we'll do an exercise where you can practice yourselves. So 
This example, um, I'm just drawing from a parenting program that I'm involved with, that I'm aware of. And when I think through like, okay, what is it that that program is trying to uh, do or change or influence? Um, but first we would hope that it would help increase awareness of the importance of positive parenting and the impact that it has on children's health and development. And that when someone has that awareness, then we would hope to see an increase in knowledge of positive parenting strategies. So just knowing what they are, how to use them, um, that by participating in the program, they would also uh, have increased confidence in their role as a parent, that feeling of, I can do this. And that if they're feeling more confident, then we're more likely to see um, participants reporting an increased use of the actual positive parenting strategies that they've learned. And then if they're using those strategies, then we would hope to see and be able to measure improvements in parents' ability to handle parenting challenges calmly and consistently. That's part of what we mean by positive parenting. And that when parents are able to do that and feel like they've got the tools and the confidence to do that, um, that we would then also see or be able to measure improvements in the child's behaviors. And behaviors, meaning their social, emotional uh, behaviors, um, things like that. And then if these behaviors have improved or changed, that then we'd also hope to see improvements in the parent's emotional well-being. So that's a, a form of status, um, that they would be less stressed, they would report that they're feeling less anxiety and less depression, um, and that parents would also be reporting improvements in their children's social emotional health. Um, and these actually are, um, in terms of the behaviors, the status, and even the confidence, those are things that, that uh, this particular program actually has tools and a process in place to measure. These are outcomes that, um, that have been shown that this program can influence uh, and produce. And so, um, but there are also times when depending on how the service is delivered, uh, especially if we modify this particular evidence-based program, we might find that no, realistically, what we can measure is that the participants are saying they have an increased level of confidence. We might not actually have the opportunity or it might not be meaningful or relevant to try, be trying to measure changes in behavior or status because of the way that the services were delivered. So that's one example. Um, that I can think of, and Nicole has another one from public health. Yeah, so this one is similar, but in a different arena of um, helping people quit tobacco. So lots of people may, excuse me, may know that tobacco is harmful, but they may not relate that to their own uh, behaviors and intent to quit. So this is drawing from things like stages of change where you move people towards um, a skill or a behavior change by increasing their awareness and knowledge and changing their attitudes and beliefs. So it's trying to do these incremental things that lead to a behavior change instead of just leaping over them to try to have an unrealistic expectation that people will change behaviors overnight. So if you had some kind of health education program that was trying to increase awareness, not just of, of the harmful health effects of tobacco, but the fact that social norms have changed, it's some of these policies have been in place that make it harder to light up a cigarette in public spaces, et cetera. So all of those things work together on awareness, but then maybe there's some extra layers of knowledge that you would wanna measure or, um, or pinpoint in your health education messaging about the harms to people around you. So even if you're not worried about the effects on you yourself, you might be more motivated to quit if you were worried about children or pets, for example. And maybe you weren't as aware of resources to help you quit. Um, the last time you tried or thought about this, or maybe you have seen more success stories. There's so many ways that this um, continuum from awareness to knowledge to uh, changes in attitudes and skills can occur. If you had a previous unsuccessful attempt, maybe somebody wants to highlight the, the new things to try or the fact that you can learn from your previous quit attempts. And again, 
you might be able to use some evaluation tools like surveys or interviews or questionnaires to gauge that. And then ultimately you want somebody to have the skills to succeed. So the more that they know about what the triggers might be for them to, to want to smoke, how they can avoid those situations, what, what their self-talk is in those situations, those are all skills that increase the likelihood that someone will have a successful quit attempt or even knowing that many people require multiple tries to do so. And then there's specific behaviors related to actually quitting. So setting a quit date, identifying who can support you, reaching out to those people who can support you and learning from relapses that that's part of your history. Um, and then all of that could lead either to a successful quit attempt or something that lasts longer than the previous one, moving you towards um, a, a state where a status where you have actually quit. So those are the kinds of things that have their roots in different kinds of um, addiction work, but could apply to a number of public mm -hmm. health behavior change and other kinds of behavior changes as well. So for the purposes of this exercise, it's thinking about where you would place your outcomes on this, this chain, how you would know that it's happening, what kinds of questions you would ask. And again, as Nicole said, not that you're going to do all of this, but just um, to help you um, really articulate what, what you're trying to accomplish and where your effort is. Um, we often think with, with theories of change and logic models and these result chains that when you are trying to do this to really lay out the, um, the logic behind what you're doing, sometimes it raises new questions or um, differences that, between you and your colleagues about, oh, I didn't think we were doing that, or yes, I thought we were doing that, but I thought we were working over here in this area instead of that area. Or one of the things that, um, that you notice about why people may not have support or skills, maybe that's, an, that's a place where you would add emphasis in your messaging or your program or your intervention. So there are a lot of different ways to use this, but um, just like theories of change and logic models, Getting it um, out on screen or paper, discussing it, being specific can be super helpful in both uh, program design and evaluation design. And of course, proposal writing. So back to you, Nicole. Thanks, Nicole. And <laughs> I'm realizing too that there's uh, the English slide title up here, I should say tobacco <laughs> association, not parenting program. Well, we got the Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even yes. notice that. Oh. Right to it. Okay, well. We'll we'll change that when we resend yeah. this out. Um so yeah, the, it's, for, it's for parents who smoke. <laughs> <laughs> um and so what we want to have you do is, is give you a chance to try this out for yourself. So again, if you've already drafted some outcomes, this is an opportunity to maybe take another look at those and, and think through, oh, is that how you uh, is that how you want to phrase them? Do you want to refine anything? Is there anything about those outcomes where um, the equity lens could be more explicit or does that really show up more in your theory of change and, and other responses in your core application? Um, so we're going to give you about six minutes to just do some individual work. If you want to uh, refer to those sample phrases in that strategies and program outcomes menu on data share, uh, you can click on that link that Gisela put in the chat earlier. Um, if you want to use that results chain template and, and use a blank copy, Gisela also just put a link in the chat uh, to a Google Doc. And so what we would suggest is either if you use Google Docs, like make a copy so that you can edit it or download it and open it up as Word. But then that's something you can either, um, <coughs> excuse me, type in or if you printed it out before today's training, um, you can write, write it in there. Basically, we're gonna suggest that you um, draft or, or revisit one to two of your short-term or intermediate outcomes for your program. We'll give you about, again, now we'll give you about five minutes to work on it on your own, and then we'll come back and see if anyone would be willing to share what they, what they have. Yeah, Thomas, I see your, um, your comment in the chat. 
In your outcome examples following the results chain, I didn't see the inclusion of the results of using an equity lens in particular. Um, yeah, and I forgot to mention that um, in the examples in the results chain, um, like what I'll often do, and I did that in the in my example, was just kind of thought through like, okay, what is the change, right? That what is kind of the progression of change? But then, and so it's not exactly phrased as the outcome statement yet. And so like if, so then when I'm ready to prepare my outcome statement, that's where I might add things like, you know, if I'm um, applying that equity lens, if there's a particular group of parents or type of parents or a particular area I'm reaching, or um, that's where I might try to weave that in to make it clear, like, you know, for who, you know, um, who is it <laughs> that I'm hoping to see that change uh, occur with. Um, sometimes the outcome itself, the statement itself, may not lend itself to, because you also don't want your outcome statement to be so crammed with so many words that then it doesn't make sense. So depending on, again, what the proposed program or approach or strategy, strategy is, it may fit well in the outcome statement, or it may be that you have to really then make sure it's clear in your other responses about the problem or need that you're addressing and the inequities, the root causes and all that, so that by the time you get to the outcome statement or the reviewer and the reader gets to the outcome statements, they understand the whole context about why that particular outcome uh, is phrased the way it is. And I, I would add um, for tobacco, for example, that sometimes those are um, equity differences by age and sometimes they're place-based, you know, to, tobacco companies are famous or infamous for marketing in low-income neighborhoods, um, marketing to kids. And so there may be, when, you, when we ask about the systemic forces and the kinds of things that are structural that affect something as individual as a health behavior, that's, that's usually uh, lurking um, and can be made more explicit in the way that we phrase things, the questions we ask, who is participating, all of those things. But it's a good point. It's it's uh, sometimes that's a layer, a lens that we look through at the beginning of the process, and sometimes it's already baked in to whatever we're we're doing, and sometimes it comes later. But the the point of all of this is to make sure it's it's there somewhere, and we'll we'll build that in a bit as we go ahead with these examples that you're working on too. And would anyone, so thanks for that. Thanks for that question or that comment, Thomas. Um, would anyone be willing to share one, at least one of their outcome statements that they came up with, either share it in the chat or if you'd like to come on camera and come off mute, share it with us. Okay, I'll do this for you though. I don't want to do this. Um, I, uh, so, uh, and help me with this. That's, um, so um, talking about social uh, connectedness um, and talking about the challenges that somebody has, whether they're unhoused, low income or whatever sort of disenfranchised group where that um, also becomes an issue of self-worth and maybe there's been some social challenges within the family and something like that. So having a program that has to do with connectedness, but also within the group and self-worth, and then working individually with the person to reconnect with family and friends. So the first, that's the long way of saying. So a short-term outcome could be like having an action plan to overcome two to three challenges to reconnecting with family and friends. Um, on the part of that that is with an equity lens, um, I'm not quite clear how to say it right there other than um, their challenge may be more within their demographic as opposed to another demographic but I, I'm not quite clear how to add that in. 
Well, Serge, first of all, thank you for always stepping up and, and attending so many of our trainings, but also participating so fully. It's very much appreciated. Um, but I think you're on the right track in thinking about how might this experience of isolation and overcoming it, um, the lack of social connection, be different for different groups? Are there different stigmas about mental health or drug use issues? Are there different levels of resources available to people? Are there... Um, are there forces that, that converge and make, make uh, isolation harder to break out of um, if you're you know, geographically separated from a supportive community or you burn some bridges in different ways or um, you know, if, you're, if you just don't have that, that uh, circle of support around you that can um, be a buffer in, in some situations and not in others and just makes everything harder. So that, you know, that might be by, by income, it might be by age, it might be by race or ethnicity or zip code, but there are, there are ways that there are um, structures and histories and systems that, that may make it harder for an individual to just reach out and, and ask for help, for example. Yeah, I, I could only find it like, I could fit it within awareness, like social connectedness can be beneficial and is difficult for systemic structural reasons. Um, mm -hmm. And that as a psychoeducational sort of training or, you know, conversation with people as, as an awareness um, to start with, but then exactly what you're talking about, having some measuring of demographics within different um, groups. It might be, or, or maybe what, what happens is that it changes the way that you do talk about awareness or, or knowledge or, or the skill set that you focus on, if that's, if that's relevant to what you're trying to do. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with everything that Nicole said, including the, that you're on the right track, Serge. Um, and, and also just... Um, mentioned the part that Nicole said a moment ago that sometimes in terms of where and how the equity lens gets applied, I mean, it could be all throughout the process. And so it could also be like at once you're, once you've implemented the, you're implementing the program or services, you're collecting the data. And then when you're looking at the data and, and analyzing or seeing, you know, who achieved those outcomes and who, and maybe who didn't, because, you know, there's always people that don't meet that target or the outcome that something in the looking at your outcome data and you're looking at, um, are there different groups of people that were more likely to be able to create that action plan and reconnect versus others? And are there differences in that outcome based on, um, you know, equity dimensions, you know, that can then inform, right? How you kind of rethink or, or continuously improve the program, the services, the delivery. And so there's also in the core application, and I forget if it's asked in all the tiers or only the medium and large uh, and targeted impact, but there's also a question there about how will you use your data to learn and continuously improve? So again, that could be an opportunity to weave in some of that you know, equity lens, like in terms of making sure that the program is truly reaching and, and providing the support that's needed for those that are most impacted by stigma, social isolation, things like that. Awesome, thank you. Well, thank you for, again, for sharing that example. It gave us a, a good opportunity to talk something through and share a couple more tips. I think what we'll do at this point is move on to the next, if anyone else wants to share their sample outcomes, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, but let's go ahead and move on to then thinking again. And we've talked, you know, quite a bit now about these types of questions, but I think one of our main themes or recurring themes that hopefully comes through is that, you know, applying an equity lens happens throughout the process of program planning, um, of developing your evaluation, of actually impl implementing the program, you know, looking at your evaluation data, um, so applying an equity lens to your outcomes means continuously asking questions like, what inequities are you seeing in your short or intermediate term outcomes? 
um, what policies, systems, or influence or environments might influence the gaps that you see in uh, in your data? Who defines your outcomes? Is it um, you know? And this is something that I think lots of all of us <laughs> can be. Um, this can apply to all of us, right? That we might think we know. Oh, here's the right program or service, and here's the outcome that is meaningful and achievable. And sometimes we have to remind ourselves or ask ourselves, well, is that going to be meaningful <laughs> and, and realistic and achievable? And um, is that going to resonate with the participants actually that we're serving or working with? And so sometimes this is a helpful point to then go back and think about, oh, have we checked? Have we asked our participants? Have we engaged them in the process? Um, asking questions like, well, what data are missing? Either community level data or our own program level data that maybe we need to kind of rethink again our evaluation approach. And then what would improving equity actually look like? Um, if we, the more that we can visualize and define what that looks like, um, the you know, closer we can get to really thinking about, okay, how would we actually measure that? So again, just some more uh, reminders or tips about how to uh, continuously ask these kinds of questions throughout your program planning and evaluation uh, process. And so we thought we would give everyone a chance to think about this and share some initial reflections or insi insights in pairs. Um, and I know that's just gonna check our um, breakout rooms that we have here. And because I know we've had a couple people that had to drop off. Um, so just reorganizing these a little bit. So we're gonna send you to breakouts in pairs and just give you about um, 10 minutes or so to think about those questions, applying an equity lens, and, and Giselle, I'll just put them in the chat. And as you think about the outcomes that you've drafted or, or considered um, for your core application, then share with each other kind of, you know, are there any particular equity questions that you had kind of an aha moment about or an insight about, oh, we, we, we could actually go back and think about that some more with, um, with our partners or with other staff or no, I th we really feel like we're, uh, we've are we got a handle on that one and, and feeling good, pretty good about that. So just a chance to do some reflection with some colleagues. Okay, does everyone, does that make sense what you're gonna do for the next 10 minutes or so? Actually, I think I'm going to reduce that a little bit. We'll give you eight minutes total. Okay, I'm gonna open up all the rooms. Hey, welcome back, everyone. Hopefully, you didn't, get, hopefully you didn't get cut off mid-sentence. <laughs> Mid-bark. <laughs> yes. Um, so I, we wanted to just a quick or short little debrief or, you know, popcorn style. Anybody that feels inclined to, to share something about just any insights or things that came up in your small group right now? Um, love to hear, like, what kinds of things... What kinds of things came to mind or stood out for you or resonated with you about that? Applying an equity lens to your outcomes. Again, you can either come off of mute or put something in the chat. Well, I was thinking that if you wanted to measure uh, improvement in, say, diets of uh, farm workers. Um, you could do it with, um, say, finding some kind of a, a norm of what a, a normal American diet is versus, you know, fats and carbohydrates. And that could be like a short term. And the long term could be, you know, uh, doing better than that. But trying to find a baseline that you could measure it against. And, um, and Thomas, is part of what you're describing also thinking about um, like whose norm is being used as the standard? <laughs> and part of the approach might be to kind of 
shift the understanding or reframe it in terms of versus kind of measuring or comparing against kind of the, um, you know, a white middle class standard of what nu nutrition or healthy habits uh, look like that it might come from a kind of culturally responsive or culturally specific. Um, so yeah, I, don't I, know, the, I don't know if I'm reading too much into what you just said, but. I think the challenge <laughs> is trying to find a healthier way to prepare foods that they people traditionally eat. And that's a thought. Mm -hmm. in a culturally right. sensitive way yeah yeah and have you or you know whoever's working with you on a particular program or application kind of thought through like what are some of the steps that you envision going through to sounds like there's some um maybe some education involved or maybe some like what are some of the steps in terms of the activities or services that you might implement? Well, those are the things that we're working on, but there's certainly things to, to consider to flesh it out. I was just thinking in terms of outcomes and you know how you could measure it rather than you know, a survey of are you eating more vegetables or are you eating more fruits or there might be a better way to, to measure that versus, you know, a bigger population. Yeah, so the methods question, that's kind of one thing to decide or figure out how you want to phrase your outcome and then the method in terms of how you measure that. It's often a whole other layer and challenge to, to then think through like what's what's feasible in terms of measurements is it going to you know uh, produce or or you know allow you to collect data in a way that gives you enough data to work with right that is going to be actually meaningful and, and show the kinds of results that you're looking for I think sometimes the challenge is it's easy I mean you can think about this is the outcome I want to get but sometimes it's hard to figure out how to measure it. Like when you were talking about the positive parenting and you went to that column on the far right, you know, measuring are people less anxious? I mean, that's, uh, you know, that's quite a challenge to really do it, cor you know, correctly or something you could really, you know. So I think that this would be a way to think of something and then and the challenge is, what do you want to accomplish and can you measure it? Or, or how far to the left do you have to go before you run out of options on that chart? Mm -hmm. Right, so that's where, yeah, you're exactly right that that's where a results chain could be helpful so that the ideal might be, right, that you kind of plot out that whole results chain and then the ideal might be that yes, those all of those changes would be happening um, realistically, programmatically, with the resources you have, you know, and, and not putting too much of a burden on participants, right? To then uh, be able to generate that data, like where it's almost like a slider, right? You're trying to figure out where on that results chain uh, is it meaningful and what's the most effective, culturally responsive way to obtain, you know, to collect that data. Um, and sometimes um, what that makes me think of is that we have ideas about outcomes and how to collect them and they may be great, but there may be better ideas out there and those better ideas can come from the people who are experiencing whatever it is that you're trying to measure. Um, and, you know, many years ago, I worked on an HIV education program early in the HIV AIDS epidemic in women's prison. And we asked them how they would know that their health peer education program was working. And they said, when people start stealing our cigarettes again, there was so much fear of infection that the normal uh, pattern of having your cigarettes stolen from the break room was not happening. And I, I would never have thought of that. And of course it doesn't quite fit with our tobacco <laughs> cessation example, <laughs> but, you know, maybe that's a great proxy measure. That means that you're 
your um, your education that it's not transmissible through touch got through. Um, and think things like that, or sometimes, and more recently, you know, for example, in the recovery world, if you know, or or even in criminal justice, you know, what what constitutes recidivism? What constitutes relapse? Maybe it's a, a period of stability that's longer rather than a total total clean and sober. Um, you know, what what are what are some things that the people in these programs themselves see as a success that might be different from the people delivering an intervention. Any other insights, thoughts, or just even additional questions that came up for you as we were talking through how to apply an equity lens to your outcomes in your small groups? Um, we had a good discussion on um, the outcome could be the change in behavior or the, or the change in status that you're hoping for somebody, but an outcome could also be uh, having uh, equitable demographics within your group. So your aware, like awareness of your program and how, how you do outreach um, to get people to join can also be an outcome. Right. Oftentimes we think of the, you know, the outcomes related to change in behavior or status is like, ooh, that's what we should be aiming for. Or that's like, you know, that's hitting the home run. And and that really, again, the value of that results chain is, is acknowledging there have to be many other things that happen, right? Before that, in order to be able to see or achieve that that change in behavior or status. And you know, it could start with, are you actually, you know reaching the people that you intend to reach? Um, does it, you know, are your outreach and engagement methods effective at, you know, catching the interest and uh, willingness of the, of the groups of people you're trying to reach? And so, yeah, that could be um, an important proxy for, you know, are your outreach and engagement uh, efforts effective? Right, any other, Thoughts or reflections about that before we take a break. Okay. Okay, everyone, welcome back. We wanted to return to some of the um, equity centered evaluation pieces that we talked about at the beginning and go into a little bit more detail about them and think about the shifts that might already be occurring in your organizations or that you'd like to ponder together while we're together this afternoon. So just to refresh our memories, we had these standard pieces of all evaluations that pose some questions that, about what you wanna learn, some methods to discover those things, the teams that conduct the evaluation and the different ways that we make sense of what we learn. So um, you might wanna just hang on to a scrap of paper or a post-it note or a Google Doc or whatever works for you. And as I'm going through some of these in terms of the, the specific equity dimensions, jot down which ones might grab you, which ones you've already thought about or what you might be contemplating moving forward for whatever you have in mind, either for your core RFP or other uh, projects and plans. And then we can discuss those after we go through the slides. And so again, the questions that, that start out with framing an evaluation, as we've just been talking about before the break, we pay a lot of attention to the outcomes we're tracking and how those are phrased and constructed, who benefits the most and the least from the program. So we talked about that a little bit as well before the break, you know, are the, just because people are lined up outside the door doesn't mean that we're necessarily reaching the people that we wanna reach with our program. Are there unintended consequences of our program that might exacerbate the inequities, even though we don't mean to do that? There might be ways that the program or policy is offered or implemented that inadvertently is doing that. So paying attention to that might be part of this as well. 
And then as we've talked about throughout the training today, the policies and systems and environments that influence those outcomes, how far back have we stepped from what we're looking at to be able to see those with some clarity and think about how they're influencing what we're seeing, what we're measuring, what we're evaluating, how, how the gaps in outcomes are, are driven by these kinds of things. And then a basic question of imagination of what does improving equity and its drivers actually look like for our program? What, what would that be? What would, what would be in place for that to be um, an outcome in and of itself of improving equity? These and many of the questions we're going over are from an apt associates um, publication called Embedding an Equity Focus in Evaluation. It's a pretty recent document, has a lot of good detail in it. And so we'll, we'll give you some links at the end of where you can get to that and some of the other resources we've mentioned. It's time for another cartoon and this one's about methods. So um, we're just starting to plan our evaluation. Which methods should we consider? All of them. And that's often true. Um, there's, there's kind of a, Nicole talked about an a la carte menu of, of outcomes. There's also an a la carte menu of outcomes. So do we wanna have um, a mix of qualitative and quantitative? And if so, which ones and what sequence and how do they blend together? So spending some time thinking about this and the equity dimensions of the instruments, the, uh, the ways that, that people are reached, the, the degree of burden on people who are being asked to provide information for an evaluation, all of that is, is fair game in trying to think about the equity dimensions of the methods that we're using. And so um, often we think about the voices that are represented in an evaluation and the ones that are not, and how, how hard are we trying to reach people? What could we do differently if we're not reaching them? So that might be touching on things like the outreach or recruitment that you're using. How do we incorporate things like stories, especially if they're, they're painful ones or ones that might shed a light that's not typically seen? What's, what's a way to do that without being um, offensive to the people who are sharing their stories? And then what, again, what kinds of systems indicators might be behind some of the information that we're learning and how do we assess those? So we've got a resource to suggest for that as well, which we'll mention in a bit. The same kinds of questions apply, of course, to the people behind an evaluation. So no matter how well-meaning or well-informed, are, are they really representing different perspectives? And what can you do to add those perspectives to your evaluation team? Maybe it's not a full team member, maybe the team hears from somebody else or has instruments um, run through a review of some kind. Are there other steps that you can take to bring more perspectives into the mix um, if needed? You may already be doing that. And then related to that, once you do gather information with these instruments and outreach and um, with a, a team that represents different perspectives, you still have to make sense of what you're finding. So who's actually analyzing and interpreting the data? What's missing? How does it get back to the people who shared it? That's often a step that kind of falls by the wayside. Um, what kinds of data do we use to analyze the systems part of this? How do we integrate all the different types of data to really have a, um, a fuller portrait or more comprehensive picture of what's going on? And then especially, what do we do with it um, after, the, after the evaluation is um, concluded or, or nearing some juncture where you can share the information? And related to that point, I would say just one thing about timing of evaluations. Traditionally, a lot of evaluations, as I mentioned earlier, are looking at um, gathering data over time and then presenting it kind of at some end point. And some of the more, um, more recent shifts in how evaluations are done are to really try to do the learning and sense-making all along the way. So having interim findings and sharing those and learning from those and not waiting for some end point before having useful information to make changes. So we're really interested in your reactions to these kinds of shifts. What, what shifts have you already made or are you considering making? 
in the questions, the methods, the teens, the way you make sense of all, all of the things that you learn. And if you're not already doing that, what do you think it would take to either to make those shifts or to expand them even further, maybe to other programs or other aspects of your work? We'll give you a minute to ponder that. We're about to lose one of our participants. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. So we're down to just a few of you, but we would really welcome your ideas. So, so think about this for just a second and then a couple minutes anyway, and we will um, have a chance to hear from you in just a moment. So does anyone have an example you'd like to share with our, our dwindling group? <laughs> Uh, I can go again. Um, okay, Serge. Okay, so uh, I, for accessibility, like getting the numbers of people and the demographics into our program, um, I've been doing social media stuff, but I should be reaching out more towards specific demographics of groups that are, are not normally represented. Um, and I can reach out to collaborative partners that um, work in that field and ask them specifically, like, how can I reach better to that demographic? Great. So you're recognizing that there's a gap in who you're reaching and then trying to find intermediaries who are trusted by those groups to help you connect to them. Yeah, what you said. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? Either the, the questions or the methods like Serge just described? or who, who's actually designing and implementing your evaluation or how you make sense of it? Any plans to shift any of those or any experience shifting any of those? I can ask this another way too. So as you were listening to this, any aha moment of, oh, you know, we did do that, or we could do that. Any interest in that? Or maybe at, at three in the afternoon. Go ahead, Claudette. Yeah, um, I, I, it feels kind of like an aha moment, but I think even from the, the get-go when you said uh, nothing about us without us, it just ha has been lingering in the back of my mind and reflecting on how we get our data. Um, and I know something that the county has been focusing on is increasing the penetration rate of the, the Latinx population uh, access to, to mental health services, to behavioral health services, sets, all of the above. And um, I know that there's been uh, some surveys going throughout the county of, of what are the, the limitations to uh, proposing like increasing bilingual staff. And yeah, just since you said that it's been, what are what are the surveys that we're giving out to the community? You know, what is the community saying that uh, are the barriers to accessing uh, behavioral health services? So that's been uh, somewhat a, of an aha moment of uh, how we're conducting our questionnaires, uh, how we're evaluating our program and, um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the idea that comes to mind is how do we get the input more from, from the actual recipients who are maybe not participating or haven't access services when we know that there, there has been an identified need. Great. Thanks for sharing that, Claudette. Do you know anything about how those questionnaires were developed initially just or what the plan is for, for deploying them? And you know, if, if uh, I know, I um, I know. First off, we we grab our we grab our data more from census. You know, of mm -hmm. how many uh, medical uh, plan recipients are involved, what the demographics are, how many of them are accessing services, and we can see the the disparity. Uh, and then there's a survey surveys around uh, staff like cultural competency as well as providers, uh, their their comfort. Uh, the skills that they need in order to, to feel like they're servicing various diverse populations better. 
Uh, but I'm I'm not aware of what surveys and this I'm in a new role, so I'm not aware fully of what surveys have been done towards the community. But I know that that's something that I'm thinking of as, um, yeah, I even start to partner with people to to collaborate and create these evaluations. That it's not something that that comes from me specifically or from our agency, but that involves stakeholders, recipients, community members, uh, as well as providers. Great. Yeah, because sometimes the way that we ask a question drives a different kind of answer, and especially for things, for topics that are, are sensitive or connected to different stigmas. So that's a great instinct. And it's, I also notice how you talk about all the different pieces of the puzzle, the providers, the people who access services, the people who might be eligible for services but don't access them for different reasons and trying to put that all together to understand what's, what's going on or what could be different. Thanks for that. Anybody else? So we, we could say that we got a 50% response rate. <laughs> we could say that three o'clock on a Thursday afternoon is a hard time for people to talk about evaluation. Based on, based on the initial survey, Maybe people would add sleepy to their response set. So anything else that you'd like to share or ask each other or us? Well, if you do have some questions or comments or examples to offer, feel free to either raise your hand or uh, place something in the chat but I'll go ahead and just mention um, a couple of the other resources that we've been talking about all afternoon. So the Equitable Evaluation Initiative, um, these, these will all be in the chat and also in the, um, they're in the slide deck that you have. But we mentioned the Equitable Evaluation Initiative that has a, a framing paper with those three principles that we started out with in the morning, I'm sorry, in the early afternoon. The equity and evaluation uh, models of how equity can and does impact evaluation has a lot of great examples if you just want more fodder for thinking through how this, what this would look like if you were doing more of it. Um, the, I mentioned in the, the types of questions and prompts that we just went over, those are from the Apt Associates um, piece that you see there, embedding an equity focus in evaluation, and that has uh, we, we adapted our questions from the, theirs. And then if you are interested in how to look at systems through these kinds of lenses and how to connect what happens in systems to outcomes in programs and policies, this Strive Together uh, publication, it's focused on early childhood, on cradle to career initiatives, but it's got a lot of great ideas and information and it's also quite recent. And so um, that might be a great resource to to just stimulate some thinking about the role of systems in what you're looking at and also into program design. So those are just some suggestions. And if you come across others that you found useful, we'd love to know about them. So let us know. One more chance to ask any questions you may have or that have been brewing as we've been talking. Nicole, I just remember that there was a suggestion we made in the first training earlier this week that I um, forgot to say today, like when you're developing your outcome statements, we, didn't sh we, we don't show this in our examples or in that strategies and programs um, outcomes menu on data share, but our suggestion is like when you write your outcome statements, like X percent of participants will, you know, whatever your changes to then add as measured by, and then say what that tool is that you'll be using to, to gather that data. Um, it, 
it, it'll just help again the reviewer, the reader, um, to understand. Oh, you actually have a method in mind. You have a process in place um, to then be able to. So if you're if you use a survey that has a name or such and such pre and post questionnaire or you know whatever it might be, uh, it can just be a, a depression thing to scale add. or yeah. Yeah, that's a great reminder. And, and you don't need, need to have it in hand. Maybe it's something that you're going to design or are in the process of designing or thinking about, but just let the reviewer know that you've thought about it and have a plan. That's also a, a good reminder, Nicole, that whether or not your program is part of something larger, a national effort or a state curriculum or whatever it is, um, if you look at other examples, they often have evaluation instruments and tools embedded in those reports and um, presentations about findings. And it may give you some ideas about what to ask and how, or maybe you will improve theirs by adding an equity lens to someone else's instruments. So you don't always have to start from scratch. Any other questions or thoughts? Okay, let me just do a quick review of next up. So tomorrow morning, we have some group office hours. 9 to 10 and 10 30 to 11 30. We have trainings next week back to back on the same day on January 18th on using data and stories for continuous learning and improvement. And then we have more group office hours on the 19th and the 26th um, morning and afternoon as people get closer to the RFP deadline. And we also have all of that information on how to sign up for those in the chat. And there are still one-on-one -on -one TA slots available. So we hope that you have um, gotten some ideas about ways to apply these principles to your both your core RFP and other work as well. And we really do appreciate your feedback, um, especially because these sessions are ongoing. We made a couple little tweaks to today's just from feedback we got on Tuesday. So we do really listen to your feedback and put it to good use. So please do fill out this survey that Nicole is putting up. And we thank you for hanging in there with us. And we look forward to seeing you at a future core event. <laughs>